years, John has been delivering powerful and impactful presentations that captivate, motivate, and teach audiences techniques of, to overcome challenges in creating a new normal in their own lives. Although John has been speaking for over two decades, he's somewhat new to GDA, and we could not be more excited. We are always eager to welcome new talent, especially new talent that is easy to work with and gets <laughs> great feedback. And recently we booked John, and I just wanted to share with you the feedback from our clients. They said John was amazing to work with. He tailored his keynote to include information about our company and our culture, and he left our audience feeling inspired. John is an amazing storyteller. He has an ability to captivate audiences, even via Zoom, which is quite impressive. We had a couple of tech issues and he rolled with the punches and was a complete superstar. We're grateful for his time and we hope to have him again. So, like I said, new talent, great feedback, easy to work with. That's a winning combination for me. John has a super inspiring story to share with you today, and I do not want to get in the way. So I'm going to go off camera. I'm going to pass the microphone to John, as they say, and I'll join back up at the end. John, welcome, and I'm turning it over to you. It's all yours. Hey, thanks, Gail. I hope everybody's doing great out there. Just give me a thumbs up or something in the chat that you can actually hear me. That's the most important question when we're live and on Zoom, right? So I was at the Paralympic Games in 1996. I had just uh, gotten my artificial leg and I, you know, I'm on the Paralympic swim team and I really wanted to be on the track and field team. My wife at the swim event, she's very pregnant with our daughter, Ashley, uh, and I just got out of the pool. I'm toweling off and I'm kind of waiting to see what's going to happen next. And I look over at a, at a little closed circuit television and I see a gentleman who's on the long jump runway. He's got an artificial leg above the knee like myself. Now, I was a 27 foot long jumper at the University of Arkansas. So this intrigued me. I'd never seen a person run leg over leg down the long jump runway for a competition. And this guy starts barreling down the runway faster and faster, hits the takeoff board, leaps up into the air, the apex of his flight, his artificial leg flies off. <laughs> I've never seen this before. He lands here, artificial leg lands about three feet up in front of him. Whole crowd does a Macaulay cock, a home alone. But the long jumper turns back to the official, says, hey, Chad, where are you going to measure my jump from? From right here, my artificial leg landed up there. <laughs> I thought that was a brilliant attitude to have. Have you ever been doing something that was very excellent, but it just was on the wrong path? I mean, in my case, I was on the Paralympic swim team, one of the highest honors to represent the United States at a World Games, this World Parallel Games to the Olympics. You know, I wanted to be on the, the, the Paralympic uh, track and field team. I never knew I could actually run. Have you ever felt like that? I think that's one of the, the mind shifts that we're going to talk about today as we talk about building and embracing a new normal mindset. So let me get the screen share up real, real fast and just kind of just share with you really quickly uh, this kind of concept around how we embrace this new normal mindset and begin to, to move. So did you have a perspective shift like I was having? In between 2020 and 2021. Let's go over really quick to Minty. And we're going to do this real fast just to uh, put over there on your screen. Now you should see uh, a, a title slide at the top that says www.mintimenti.com. And if you use the code 4292-7424, that's 4292-7424, we're going to just, just kind of put your name in there real quick. Um, and we're just going to see if make sure it's working first because we're not going to waste any time if it's not working. So just put your name in there real quick. Just go to menti.com. When the box comes up, put your 4292-7424 number in there. We'll see if it's going to work real fast. But did you have a perspective shift that happened in that time, time frame? Let me see. So I don't see anybody put, putting in there. Amy's in there. Okay, Doug Spooner's in there. All right, awesome, cool. Doug, thank you. And Amy, thank you for being in. Drusilla's in there. Thank you so much for being on. Okay, so in this time now, we're going to just kind of shift it over. Let me see if I get over here to the next question real fast. Brooks in. Um, did you have a perspective shift? Yes or no? Or uh, what happened between 2020 and 2021? <laughs> yes, absolutely. We have this perspective shift. Three people saying perspective sh shifts. Yes, yes, yes. We have these perspective shifts that happened 
during these times? Five people said yes, perspective. No one said, what happened between 2021? You know, no one, no one was asleep at the wheel. <laughs> well, one of the things that I began to understand uh, during this process, because I had a perspective shift, was how we show up when difficult times actually happen. And I frame it around this concept entitled the new normal. Now, if you put in the chat box, how many are sick and tired of hearing the term the new normal? I'm looking down here because that's where my chat window is. How many are sick and tired of hearing the term the new normal? Uh, you could, it's okay. You can put tired, sick, and tired ducks when it is. Yes, says Sherry. Absolutely. Yes, wonderful. I want to give you a different maybe a different perspective on how I show up with this term, the new normal. Need a better term, says Amy. Yep, all these things. Um, I've been using the term now for like 20 years, so I really don't care what you're all saying in there because I want to keep on using it. But let me give you a, a different perspective on how I use the term. And maybe we can have a mindset shift of our own. We just don't have to go one way. So it's open to share back up. And as you see, embrace the new normal. Now, most people are using this the term this way. I can't wait till things get back to normal. That's a past way of thinking about this term, of saying this term. The next one is, I guess this is just our new normal. And that's a present state. That is a destination. We've arrived. But if we look at the term, the new normal, really what we're saying is the new normal is new is no prior point of reference. Means when something is absolutely new, there is no reference point to it. So why are we trying to put old, as an adagio would be old wine into new wineskins, old ideas into new thoughts, it burst. We can't do it. And, and we, we struggled so hard. We lost our oxygen out of our environment. We were scrambling trying to figure that out, right? What we were doing, how do I know we lost oxygen? Because we're, we're buying toilet paper to try to fix our problems. <laughs> and even when we come out, we're thinking we're coming out of this pandemic. A lot of folks on airlines are fighting flight attendants. We lost oxygen out of our environment. How do we put our new, bring our new into a new environment? Normal then is the everyday typical occurrence of a thought or an action. That means we have a ritual that we put in place that leads us to a rhythm that elevates us to a rise that creates the results that we desire. The new normal then is not a destination, but it's only a plateau by which we grow. What do I mean? Well, in this sense of the word, in this case of the, the plateau by which we grow, think about the Olympic and Paralympic games that are about to start. The Olympic model is swifter, higher, stronger. Notice that those words are not written in the superlative. It's not the highest form of the word. It's not EST, swiftest, highest or strongest. Yes, we want to be the best, but there's an ER stem ending that gives us the opportunity to grow. If Olympians and Paralympians are training four years from today, the way they're trained today, they've already lost the gold medal. They can be the swiftest today, be swifter tomorrow. We can jump the highest today, jump higher tomorrow. We can always elevate. And that's where we are with this term, the new normal mindset. It's a plateau by which we grow. So think about that as we go through this, this kind of uh, mindset story right now. And I invite you to think about one thing. The one thing I invite you to think about is, is what do you think I overcame during my process? What was it that I overcame? So it was October the 30th, 2000. I'm sitting in a gate waiting area in the uh, um, San Francisco International Airport. I am wearing shorts. I'm, wear, uh, I, I'm reading a USA Today newspaper. Uh, and because I'm wearing shorts, uh, my artificial leg is showing. There begins to be this conversation that is about 20 yards off to my left, your right. Two boys, five and seven, they're talking to their mother, their matriarch, uh, about a new discovery they have made. Mommy, mommy, look at that guy's legs. That guy's leg over there, look at the guy's leg. There goes robot man. So I started chuckling, but I went back to reading my USA Today newspaper. Then something else happened. I began to hear this outer speak conversation, which really re should have remained inner speak conversation about those two boys, five and seven, who just discovered Robot Man. Now, you know, I won't get into the question. Usually we do this as a non-rhetorical, uh, but most people are saying, shut those kids up. Get them out of here, impolite, bad mother. I was like, wow, that's interesting. But I went back to reading my USA Today newspaper. Then something happened. Out of the corner of my eye, I see the woman, she gets up, she starts walking over in my direction with the two little kids in tow. And I think she's gonna do like that famous song says, and just walk on by. But no, she stops, she leans in and says, excuse me, sir, my children, absolutely fascinated, 
by your artificial leg. It looks like you've overcome so much adversity. You're such an inspiration. <laughs> Would you please tell them what happened? <laughs> no one has ever asked me in such a public setting, what's going on with my artificial leg and what happened? I mean, one-on-one -on -one stories, yeah, but never in a setting like that with all these uh, people in the gate waiting area who began to have this outer speak that's really should remain inner speak about those two boys that were asking about Robot Man. And in the space between her question and my response, I began to try to formulate an answer. Why does she think overcame the adversity? Maybe I was just born this way. Why did she think I was an inspiration? I mean, I could be an ax murderer. I'm not, <laughs> yet. <laughs> <laughs> and why was everybody else that had that outer speak conversation that should remain inner speak conversation? Why were they now leaning in? And in the space between her question and my response, I found my answer. I didn't overcome the adversity. You see, just six and a half years earlier, May 24th, 1994, I'm lying in a hospital bed. My wife, Alice, is holding on to my left hand. My parents are on the opposite side of the bed. Little John Jr. is at the foot of the bed. He's playing with a toy train. And the pain, the pain was tremendous. Dr. Randy Mullins, he walks into the room. He's got a white lab coat on, thesoscope around his neck, clipboard in his hand. Takes one look at me and says, uh, Mr. Register, you, you, you have a, you got a tough choice to make. You can either keep your limb use a walker or a wheelchair for the rest of your life, or I can amputate your leg and you can use a prosthesis for the rest of your life. Now, what kind of choice is that? You see, just seven days earlier, man, I was on top of the world on the Army's world-class athlete program track and field team, twice had been to the Olympic trials, four-time track and field All-American at the University of Arkansas, go pigs. All, Army combat veteran on my way to officer candidate school. Life was gravy right before me. Uh, USA Track and Field News, because of my time the week prior in the 400 meter hurdles, had said I was one to watch for the 1996 Olympic Games, eighth in the country, top 20 in the world at that time. I get off the bus, we're gonna do my normal shakeout. Now the 400 meters hurdles is one time around the track, over 10 obstacles spaced 35 meters apart, 45 meter lead into the first hurdle, 40 meter runoff of the last hurdle. I'm approaching every hurdle at the speed of speed of 8.7 meters per second, which is what? Put that in the chat box. I wanna see in the chat box. Um, put in the chat, how, how, how fast was it going? Um, so I'll, I'll read it back when I see it. Uh, somebody's gonna say, fast. <laughs> and that's the right answer. Really fast is the right answer. Uh, I was it's about 19 and a half miles an hour. And I'm ambidextrous. I can take ambidextrous. I can take the hurdle with either leg. But the wind's blowing hard in Hayes, Kansas that day. And I'm having problems with my steps. I'm getting the right legs coming up, the left legs coming up, the left leg and the right leg. And sometimes in hurdles as in life, we just want things to stay the same. So I get in the blocks, do one last proverbial pass, right leg leads, I'm on. Second, second hurdle comes into view, right leg leads again, I'm on again. Third hurdle's coming into view, I feel the Kansas wind push against me, but I push back against the Kansas wind. But I realize I'm gonna be short and have to take the hurdle with my left leg. No problem, I've done this thousands of times before. Off the right leg, I go across the hurdle with my left leg, I land and I hear <laughs> And my body sails and twists in the air and I see my left shin pass in front of my face. My shoulders hit the ground and I bounce to a halt. I do a quick one on my body, you know, my shoulders are okay, my waist is okay. When I saw my knee, the patella had risen three inches up my femur bone. The left leg was now canted across my right leg and my foot was touching the black surface of the track. Now, let me just step off the track just for a second and show you this picture of a smart second lieutenant who took nine pictures that day. And the next picture I wanna show you is the picture, the graphic of what happened that day. But if you're a little bit squeamish, you can turn away. If you are not, you can say, show me, show me, show me. Uh, if, if, but if you're undecided, you can do this. <laughs> All right, so uh, <laughs> let's, let's see. Let's go into this. I wanna just kind of show you what's going on in this picture. I'll just kind of really quickly go through it. And you'll see that my foot is on the bottom of the track here. If you come up with the shin bone, you'll see the dislocation of my 
left knee. My head is down here. Dino's head is on my head. Ben Curitan, I'm supposed to go to Officer Candidate School. He's in the white shirt over here with Dino. Uh, I'm supposed to go to Officer Candidate School with him. The paramedics are setting my knee and Tony Sylvester, Sergeant Tony Sylvester, he's got his eyes locked in on me just in case I open my eyes. He's a combat medic, saved over 10 lives over in Iraq and Afghanistan. He knows exactly what to do in this moment. So let me step back onto the track. The only thing I could think about in that moment was just get up. Come on, John, just push yourself up. Just get up, push yourself up, John. You got this, push yourself up. You can do it, get this, oh, oh, oh God. And then 90 minutes later, the ambulance came. I was put in the back and whisked off to Hayes Medical Center where another doc in a, in a lab coat comes in and says, Mr. Register, looks like you got a bit of a problem. I'm gonna have to fix that. So he bore down on that crooked leg, said, we're gonna do this on three. One, my, balloon, my leg ballooned up, I passed out, I don't remember too much. I don't remember the medevac ride to Wesley Medical Center in Wichita from Hayes. I don't remember the bane graft operations I underwent. All I remember is my wife, Alice, holding on to my left hand, my parents on the opposite side of the bed, little John Jr. playing with that toy train at the foot of the bed and Dr. Mullen saying, you got a tough choice to make. Now it was the pain that spoke first because my male deductive reasoning said, like, just get rid of the leg, I'll get rid of the pain. So I looked back at Dr. Mullen and I said, I know it has to be amputated and he goes right into motion. Two nights later, I wake up leg is gone and I'm in more pain than my male deductive reasoning had reasoned. I wanted to just knock it out. So I saw a morphine drip button over there, but I couldn't roll over. I was too weak to roll over to press the button. I could see the nurse's aid station just outside my window. I thought I'd call out to them, but the tubes that have been down my throat made the sound to an, to an, to an audible to, to catch their attention. So there I lay in that bed for the next eight hours with my dangerous thoughts. Who am I now? What's my identity? Is my wife gonna stick around? Is my son still gonna see me as his father? Do I still have a job in the military? Can I support my family? I mean, my Olympic dreams are over. At eight in the morning, Dr. Mullins, he comes back in the room, sees me, sees I've done a 180 degree shift, immediately calls my wife, Alice, who's at the hotel, trying to manage herself, me, John Jr., her mother-in-law, and she just found out at seven o'clock that morning that the job she's working in Crawfordsville, Arkansas, has just fired her because she's been gone too long taking care of me. And she comes running over, takes them 45 minutes to get me out of the bed, into a wheelchair, wheeled out to an inaccessible playground where I'm there, I'm parked, in front of the rocks, forced to watch my wife and my son play on the swing set. And I couldn't push myself out of that chair. It was the first time I felt devalued, dejected, disabled. I lost it, started crying uncontrollably, heaving sobs, heaving sobs. Alice sees me struggling, she comes running over and she begins to say, what is wrong, babe, what's wrong? And I began to articulate to her every single thing that was in my head, those fears I had the night before. And then she said, and she said the words that stopped my downward spiral. You know what, John? We're gonna get through this together. It's just our new normal. It's just our new normal. When she spoke those words, she baselined my entire existence, like she, she undergirded me. And as I began to wipe the tears away from my eyes and just kind of move, move them around, I see John Jr. He jumps off the swings, come, hits the ground and starts running towards us. Hey, mom, dad, you see my big jump? You see my big jump, mom and dad? And he jumps between myself and Alice. In those 20 yards, he just validated me as his father. And he just created his new normal. And that's exactly what I had to do. I had to create my new normal. So I looked back at the woman in between her question and my response. And I said, you know, ma'am, I don't think I overcame what you think overcame. Because had I overcome the amputation of my left leg, I'd have my leg back. And then she said, huh. So I ask you the same question right now as we just stick a pen and just pause there just for a moment and ask you the question, what is it that you think I overcame. Why don't we just, as you're going out there, just, just think about that just for a second. 
Uh, and we'll go back to Minty and see if we have that up and we can pop that question in there. If I didn't overcome the amputation of my left leg, then what do you think I overcame? And just kind of put anything in there. And I'll start talking about just a little bit. If you say fear, fear is right. But a lot of times as we're discovering during COVID, as we're discovering during George Floyd's murder, as we're discovering during the, the heated political election, a new mindset. I love that. Somebody's in my notes. <laughs> um, yeah, I had to overcome the, the, the mind and that was it. Fear and mindset. Yes, look at those things, right? Coming in. Um, it's it's amazing, right? Because we were understanding it wasn't it wasn't the object, it wasn't those things that were that were happening that were overcoming. It was our mindset, a new physical reality about your body, the idea that your life would not be what you thought it was going to be. Yes, all of that. And when we see this from the standpoint, right, of of understanding this new normal mindset and, and understand these new realities about myself and my body. And, and thank you for putting those in there. Look at this from this standpoint. I'll go back to this other slide now and just kind of begin to share with you the three things, right? That I thought, individual fears. It wasn't my fear that Alice was gonna leave. My fear was, am I still desirable? Do I still belong? That's the number one in the in the when the, the 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 new Maslow hierarchy of needs. It's belonging, not really food. I want to know if I belong. And then other people, other people believing for me what I can or cannot do, which is based upon what they believe they could or could not do if they were in my situation. And then third, society. What is society telling me about my fears in the first place? Was it when I watched Captain Hook? Captain Hook's an amputee. <laughs> And Captain Hook, you know, got his arm put off by TikTok. Wait a minute, I'm an amputee. Am I dark, mysterious, and scary now? Scaring the Lost Boys? Is that why people want to say, go down a different aisle? Get away from that person? We have these fears because we want to belong. Now, I'm going to fly through this whole deck because uh, the rest of it, because it's 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 too much to unpack in a, in a short amount of time. But I want to give you just a sense of how we get out of it, right? Because it's great to have an inspirational story, but if we don't have a way out of it, yeah, it's just a great story. So let's look real quick at how we get out of this. How do we turn from it? So from this new normal mindset. So we talked about the first three, the fear of self, others, and society fear. And then we have to we have to rebuild. That's the next one. But we're not rebuilding what we think we were, we're rebuilding. Because if, we, if I overcame the amputation of my left leg, I'd have my leg back. So we have to see it's, it's something else. It's a false foundation that we're getting to. And this is one of the questions I ask attendees when we're doing a, a breakout or we're doing some sessions is what do you anticipate getting back that's holding you back? from this new normal mindset that you need to have. And then we move on to a redefining moment. It's be, we begin to have the glimpse of, of something that might be possible. Uh, and then we get to this release. And we say that when our truth outweighs our fear, we'll commit to re a release. If our fear outweighs our truth, we'll always stay on that left side of the, of the pathway. We won't release. But when we do release, then we know that, this is our slide, when our truth outweighs our fear, we'll commit to a courageous life. When we do release, we have a rebirth. And the rebirth is actually harder after we do the release because there's a lot of work that we have to do with inside of that, okay? And then now we have the resolve. And the resolve is I'm so strong because of it, after I do the work, I'm so strong that I'm never going back to the way other people think. You need to catch up to where I am. And that's the resolve. And then finally that equals our release and our freedom. But the freedom is not for us. We know now that the freedom is to go back and help somebody else that's on our team, that's in our sphere of influence, to overcome the fears that they are with. And once again, it's a long process and a journey to get there. But when our truth outweighs our fear, we will commit to a courageous life. If not, we start making excuses and not even just excuses, we start justifying why we're not courageous to make the jump. So let's look at this from the standpoint of the, the new normal, the part two now. The woman says, oh my gosh, that was fantastic. What happened next? And, she, and I said, I'm glad you asked. I started swimming for physical therapy with this new normal mindset, put my mind sight on something different. And I fluked up, messed up and made the Paralympic swim team. I saw athletes running and jumping on artificial limbs. I said, I got to get one of those. And four years later, after learning how to run, I went to Sydney, Australia. And these were the results. Let's take a look at the men's long jump F42 final starting list and Lucas Christen from Switzerland is the dominant one in this field. He holds both the world and Paralympic record in this event. Victor Goransson from Sweden is up now ready for his third attempt. It's not a bad effort. He's pretty satisfied with it. 4.89. It's actually a season best for the Swede. 
Here is the man to beat. He is the world record holder, jumping 5.43 in 98 in Birmingham. Well, he's pleased the crowd. He's happy with that one. And so he should be. He's smashed his world mark with 5.57, a new world mark. Well, the pressure's really on now for John Register from the USA. 5.57, the mark to beat. Nice lead up, but it's short. He's not able to take the gold from Kristen, but he does move into second spot. So here are the results of the men's long jump final. Gold to Kristen, silver to Register, and Goriansen home with the bronze. All right. Yay. So <laughs> awesome. Okay. Fantastic. So let's, let's just kind of see, you know, what kind of the, re the resolve of it all. Right. So here's, here's what I think. There was a, um, an athlete, uh, the reporter asked me after that competition was over, she said, John, I saw you run in the Southwest conference with Carl Lewis and Michael Johnson. Do you think that you can run and jump with those two athletes again? And I said, no, but maybe your question should be, if God forbid Carl Lewis or Michael Johnson lost a limb, could they run as fast or jump as far as I do? And that's really the catch up. That's where we want people to be from our presentations. I will say this, I will say this, uh, that uh, every time I see that video, I think I'm gonna win the gold medal. I missed it again, Doug. <laughs> so we see that throughout this whole process, this whole time, we are able to, overcome the adversity with with having a different mindset about what we where we want to be and uh, my wife and i now have been married 33 years that's my wife alice uh then we have john jr he's now 30 uh, 30 33 years old he's coaching basketball uh and then ashley we have ashley remember she was pregnant uh, we we're pregnant with her uh well ashley's here because you know one of my fears in the hospital ashley's here because everything still work just saying uh, and then Ayana is our is our heartbeat uh, for for that uh, as as John Jr.'s son, and we say, and that's my alarm saying it's time to quit. So let's stop. Um, so we say to go forth and inspire your world. You see all these things that we have learned today, kind of overcoming the adversity by using our mindset to go to a mindset to embrace a new normal. But go is our direction forth. Uh, is uh, goes our command forth is our direction inspires our vocation your because only you can do this work and world because it's your sphere of influence so we say go forth inspire your world thanks for being with us today and we'll talk to you later bye for now oh john thank you so much i mean i love a story like yours because it just reminds us you know how important mindset is and how debilitating fear can be and so um, during this time, especially coming out of COVID, you know, for people to have a perspective like yours and something to lean into, I think that's really great. So thank you so much. And thank you to all of you who joined us live and to all of you who I know will be watching when we send you the link tomorrow. Um, if you are interested in discussing what it might look like to bring John in to speak live for your group or some, some of our clients are still doing virtual events, give us a call here at GDA and we can talk through that with you. Uh, thank you so much, John. And for those of you who follow GDA Live, we'll be back in August with uh, Daryl Davidson. He's got a Really interesting story. Um, he is a black man who befriended members of the Ku Klux Klan and over 200 people have turned in their hoods and robes to him. So it's a really different and interesting story and we hope you'll join us next month. And to everybody out there, thanks again for joining us. And if you want more information on John, let us hear from you, please. Thank you. Have a great day.